Hi, and welcome to this latest Immigration Law Conversation video. Today, I've got a returning guest. Uh, Shara Pledger is back once again. She hasn't been here for some time, but when we previously talked about some business immigration visas and visit visas, uh, those videos were really helpful. So today, Shara, who's a specialist corporate immigration lawyer, is back to talk about a hot topic, that of e-visas. Shara, for those who haven't seen our previous videos. Well, thank you for coming back first and tell us a bit about you and what you do. Yeah, thanks very much. And thanks for, for having me back. So as you mentioned, I'm a, a corporate immigration specialist. So I've been working in immigration law for over 12 years now. And um, I'm now based at Pinsett Masons and I head up the corporate immigration team there. Fantastic. So today we've decided to talk about an important topic we're recording this at the end of november 2024 and there's a big date looming the end of this year in terms of brps and the introduction of e-visas so tell us a bit about an, an overview of what's happening what what are the home office doing and, what, and and how is this relevant to immigrants employers and everybody in between Mm, yeah. Um, effectively, we are in the middle of a big simplification process with the Home Office. So all sorts of things are happening in the field of immigration mm. to do with that. This specific issue relates to documentation. So at the moment, as we speak today, there are people in the UK who might have a number of different ways of proving their immigration status. That might be something that's stuck into their passport. It might be an additional document that they carry around with them, such as a plastic, what we call biometric residence permit, or it might be that they have digital proof of immigration status only or an e-visa. What we are moving towards by the end of the year is stepping away from those physical immigration documents and putting everybody into the same scheme of having that digital proof of status, so the digital e-visa. And it means that we have this very hard cut-off date at the end of 2024, so 31st December 2024. That is the date that people with biometric residence permits will see their permit expires. That's really important to say this doesn't mean that people's status will change from the 1st of January. This is about how they prove their status, not about the status they have. So it's a bit similar to if you think about your passport. Um, my passport, I think, is expiring in 2027. I won't stop being a British national in 2027. I just won't have a valid passport at that time unless I take the steps to renew my documentation. And so that's what everybody needs to be thinking about doing if they don't have digital proof of status already. No, that's really helpful, Shara. And I was going to, with that date, I was going to call this video Avoiding the Cliff Edge because it does yeah. a bit of a cliff edge. Uh, so a lot of people watching this will be immigration lawyers mm -hmm. who are advising individual clients. What sort of actions should people be encouraging their clients to take? And feel free as a corporate lawyer to sort of throw in what you'd be advising your corporate clients, what action they may need to take as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the bulk of action that needs to be taken is obviously on the part of the individual, regardless of whether you're sponsored, you're a student, whatever it happens to be, you are responsible for your own immigration status. So if your document is expiring, it's your job to make sure that you take the necessary steps to get whatever comes next. That said, if you are the sponsor of a worker, for example, you will obviously be a bit concerned if somebody's got a document that might be expiring. And what you need to do will probably depend on how long you've had a relationship relationship with that particular individual. So if this is somebody that you've employed relatively recently in the past couple of years, chances are you probably did a digital right to work check for them anyway, which means that you don't actually rely on their biometric residence permit, for example. You already rely on a digital report produced directly by the Home Office that confirms this person has status that expires on this date. And that probably is not the 31st December 2024. It's probably a date into 2025, six, maybe even later. For people that have been working with you for a little bit longer, it might be that you did look at their physical BRP. And that means that you've conducted a right to work check based on a document that will be expiring. And that might be the kind of scenario where you might be thinking, well, actually, I need to get in touch with this individual. I need to make sure that they've taken the right steps to get their further proof of status and make sure that they can now tell me what their status is moving forward. And so it will be probably doing a follow up right to work check for those individuals, but nothing more. You don't need to be sort of 
you're worrying about um, kind of helping somebody to go through the application process. As I say, that's very much a job for the individuals. Luckily, it's a simple thing to do. Um, so I'm sure we're going to get on to kind of talking about the, the mechanics of doing it. But, you know, just the highlights are that it's an online application process, which is free of charge and should be quite quick. So whether you're looking at this from the point of view of an individual or from an employer or whatever it happens to be, the actual steps that are required are pretty minimal. Now that's helpful. In terms, we've, we've hinted it already that there might be some problems and issues with this this transition to e-visas what are the potential problems either you've seen already or you you foresee with with the transition to e-visas uh, I mean, in theory, it should all work pretty smoothly. But obviously, when it comes to anything to do with kind of large scale technical projects, there's always going to be something that probably is going to go a little bit wrong. Um, one of the common things that I know that people have been experiencing is what gets called entangled status. So that's where the individual registers for their EVs that they log into the system to take a look and see what information the Home Office have. And the information that's being reflected back at them is not quite right. So it might be the, a bit of an error with the name, date of birth, nationality, photo, whatever it happens to be. So in the event that something like that happens, it's really important that people don't panic. They're not about to lose their status because there is a, a technical issue with the Home Office system. But what they do need to do is address it. Don't just ignore it. If you log into the system and you can see that something's not quite right, get in contact with the Home Office and have it corrected. That They will want it to be correct. And there is actually a, a, a specialist immigration page for this or a Home Office page online, which is de um, specifically directed at addressing issues that are wrong with your e-visa. So they are aware of the fact that this can happen. They have a system in place to correct it. So it, again, quite a simple thing to do. Now, that's really helpful. And what I'll try and do is put some of the links to the Home Office policies and then from those pages, you'll be able to go to the various pages, because I think as we were discussing before we started to record, the Home Office policy is, is a bit all over the place with e-visas and there's lots of information in, in lots of different places. Yeah, that's right. And the Home Office are very helpfully um, over the last few months have run several public sessions that employers have been able to join, um, uh, education sponsors have been able to join, for example, as well, giving information about e-visas, because really what they would like to happen is that um, large scale employers and sort of education providers engage directly with the people that they are with day to day who this affects, share this information, make sure that people know what needs to be done. But the unfortunate thing about it is, as you say, it's kind of quite spread out. So you get a lot mm. of different pages from the Home Office website dealing with similar things. So you'll have a page about how to access an e-visa if you don't already have an online account. You'll have a different page that if you do have an online account, how to view it from there. You'll have another page that if you view it and it's wrong, what to do with that. So um, it could be a little bit confusing sometimes to sort of work out where exactly do I need to be in order to get to the right information. But ultimately, as soon as you start Googling, it should be pretty easy to be sort of directed and funneled into the correct place. And just in terms of practical, you talked about the mechanics of, of doing it. What are some practical tips, perhaps in, in terms of the mechanics of getting your e-visa or even resolving problems? I mean, to be honest, the most obvious tip right now is don't delay it. Um, obviously, we do have the 31st of December as our deadline. I wouldn't recommend waiting until the 31st of December, though, because if there are going to be any issues that you experience, um, it would be good to have the opportunity to get those corrected before the end of the year. And of course, with the holidays period coming up, it, it's likely that there might be some delays. Um, issues that we know do sometimes arise a lot of this focuses on the idea of um, an app through your smartphone being able to machine read details in documents. So that might be a chip in a biometric permit. That might be a chip in a passport. Occasionally those chips break. You know, so if it's the case that you're going to be in, stuck in a scenario where for whatever reason you can't complete the ID process in order to get this registered, it's better to know that now rather than finding that out on, say, the 20th of December when you're hoping to travel over the Christmas New Year period on the 20th. 23rd or something so definitely take the steps now to get all of this registered if you can um it, it is slightly unfortunate timing i think from the home office perspective to have chosen the 31st of december just because it is a time of year where a lot of people do travel yeah. there'll be plenty of people that leave the uk in order to go and probably see family over the end of the year um with a biometric permit that's valid and then they seek to return in january 
with a biometric permit which is now expired if they haven't taken the additional steps to register their e-visa in time they may find that they are either refused boarding by their flight provider um, or indeed a ref have a bit of an issue at the border um, so just to avoid really that kind of that travel inconvenience it's just about making sure that you follow the steps and then if something has gone wrong address it as quickly as you can do through the relevant home office channel if somebody hasn't already got a biometric residence permit so if they haven't got one already what should mm. they can they what, what do they do in that situation well it used to be the case that you had this quite um confusing process really where you sort of you had to apply to the home office to say look I, I have indefinite status yeah. normally in the UK but I have that in a paper document which is quite old can that be transferred to a biometric card and the home office would take quite a long time to process that application and then eventually issue a biometric card and then you would have to take the biometric permit and now register for your e-visa and yeah. um, at the end of um, last month, the Home Office stopped generating biometric residence permits, though. So it means that we can sort of cut out that middle step of the process now. And you can make an application based on the fact that you've got at the moment non-biometric proof of your status and convert that straight into being digital proof of your status instead. So it's a slightly different process to follow. Again, one which might take slightly longer, unfortunately, just because you don't have more recent details that are in the Home Office system. So if that is your situation, I would definitely recommend getting that done as quickly as you can because there won't be any problem. You're not going to lose your status at the end of the year if it's not sort of kind of come through and all confirmed by that date, of course. But what you don't want to do is be stuck knowing oh, if I, you know, if I travel, I might have a really difficult time trying to come back to the UK and nobody wants to ruin a holiday, <laughs> worrying the entire time about whether or not you're going to be permitted to board the plane back home again. So it's the message is really the same regardless of your circumstances. Just get it done. And if people have, have children, they need to know that there needs to be individual accounts yes. for children as well. You can manage, say as a parent, you can manage that account and eventually it can be transferred over to your child. But there needs to be individual e-visas for each person. Yeah, I've, also heard, I've also heard it encouraged that people keep expired biometric residence permits. They used to have to return them to the home office. Now, because it's got that chip in, which is readable, uh, they're encouraged to keep those uh, as well. Yeah, that's quite a recent change, actually, because as you say, it used to be the case um, up, up until very, very recently that if you received a positive decision, it would contain um, a little section about how to return your previous biometric card and, and also was threaten you with fines if you didn't return your previous biometric card. So it was quite a, an important thing to do. But um, the Home Office have really sort of kind of changed up that guidance to try and be useful, try and be helpful, make sure that people have got some form of alternative way of saying, you know, I'm not making this up, you know, if my there's a problem with my online system that's that's what I have at least most recently had which at the you know the very least should assist at the border if um if not with a, a flight provider and I understand I think with entry clearance e-visas are coming but not yet so sometime next year I understand I think maybe yeah that that does seem to be the plan I mean they've been very clear um at this point with their communication that those little vignettes so those initial stickers that are going into people's passports confirming their original visa they're not going away so you'll yeah. still see those if you're applying for a visa you know even into 2025 and you're applying for your first visa to come to the UK you will usually start off with a sticker in your passport not the case for everyone we've obviously already seen the transition for EU neighbors um they've got their e-visas right from the start so clearly all of the kind of the, the process is is in place in order for this to happen we're just now waiting for the next part of that process to roll out to other nationalities so it's all kind of in the pipeline but at the moment we're sort of in this little bit of a halfway house that some people will kind of get that initial stamp what I did see though um, as recently as this week is that it's now much more easy to be able to register for your um, online account much more quickly so it used to be the case back when they were issuing your biometric cards, you would get your passport vignette, you'd arrive in the UK, you'd go and collect your biometric permit, and then you could register for your online proof of your status. They have simplified that process out, again, taken out that middle step with the BRP now. And so when you get your passport vignette, you are now able to make an immediate application to register for your e-visa directly from there. Now that, that's really helpful. And if people are watching this video and are worried personally, I know there's been government funding made available for organisations to advise yeah. individuals, hopefully for free. You can also consult your immigration lawyer. There may be a charge for that, but they can help you with that. In terms of you personally, Shara, perhaps to finish off, if, if there's anything else you want to tell us about e-visas, but also in your work as a corporate immigration lawyer, if there's any corporate clients watching this, 
and they want to reach out to you, what can you help them with and how should they do that? So any final words of wisdom and then then how can you help your corporate clients? Obviously, if you're an individual watching this, as I've said, have a look for those organizations who've got the funding or consult your immigration lawyer or a good immigration lawyer. Yeah, I think when it comes to kind of to, to organizations and businesses considering this, it's quite similar to what we saw when we previously had the sort of the transition for EU nationals suddenly needing to have immigration status post Brexit. And there was all this messaging, you know, about being sensitive in the way that you approach your workforce. I think that there is a lot of parallels to be drawn from that here. What you don't want to be doing is going out to your workforce and causing concern or upset or panic in relation to your messaging so it's about being really clear you know that nobody's about to lose their job <laughs> nobody's status is about to change there might be the odd individual that you do need to conduct right to work checks for but beyond that everything is really just about being useful and helpful it's about saying you know please make sure that you've taken the correct steps and certainly when I've been working with some of my um you know sort of really large employer clients it's all just been about that messaging about making sure that the workforce is receiving information to say, you know, look, if you're traveling um, over that sort of December, January period, have you made sure that you've registered for your e-visa? We don't need anything. You don't need to come back to us. <laughs> you know, we don't need to kind of confirm anything with you in relation to it. But just for your own point of view, have you done what needs to be done to make sure that you have an enjoyable holiday while you're away? So it's really just about that kind of that that care um, and sort of taking that time to, to be useful to the workforce and make sure that they've got the information that they need. Shara, that's fantastic. Thank you so much um, for sharing uh, with us today. And hopefully we, we've, we've helped people have a more peaceful Christmas that they're yeah. not stressing so much about their e-visas and traveling and, and getting back in. What I will do, as I said, I'll put the links to the home office resources below this video, but I'll also put links to, to you, Shara, if people uh, yeah, want lovely. to reach out to you. But thank you so much for joining me today, Shara. Thanks very much.